happens when you are an international Christian celebrity made famous because you've been campaigning to get your husband out of an Iranian jail, only to find that when he's released, you can't let him back into your life because he's been abusive. Well, that is the story that we are going to cover today on the Bear Marriage Podcast as we welcome Nagma Panahi. So welcome to the Bear Marriage Podcast, where we'd like to talk about healthy, evidence-based biblical advice for your marriage and your sex life. And it is Domestic Violence Awareness Month. And when I read Nagma's book, I Didn't Survive, I was like, this is the perfect book to end October with. And so I am so thrilled to be bringing you this interview. But also in honor of Domestic Violence Awareness Month and Breast Cancer Awareness Month, we have some new merch in our store in pink and purple, pink for breast cancer and purple for domestic violence. And when you buy that merch, our biblical womanhood merch, our biblical manhood merch, our prayer and tent pegs merch, 20% of the profits from that will be going to support charities in my local area um, that help Uh, fight against domestic violence and against breast cancer. So do check those out in the store. The link is in the podcast notes. And as always, a special shout out to our patron group and to those who support us on a monthly basis. Even for as little as $5 a month, you get access to the best place on the internet, which is our Facebook group. So check us out at patreon.com slash bare marriage. And now without further ado, here is my friend, Nagma. I am so thrilled to bring on the Bare Marriage Podcast one of my heroes that I have known about for like a decade when she first hit the news, um, but I've gotten to know her personally in the last few years as we've talked online, but this is our first time talking in person. So here we have Nagma Panahi, the author of the new book, I Didn't Survive. Hi, Nagma. Hi. You just have such an amazing story. And I read your memoir in a day. It was amazing, like genuinely amazing. And so I didn't survive launched this month. You are going to love this episode. Everybody who's listening, you need to get her book because it's not just her story. It's like the story of what the Holy Spirit is doing around the world and how complicated that can be Mm. and, and how we need to keep our eyes open to, to the least of these. And honestly, it's just, it's incredible. You're going to love it. So Nagma, I want to jump into it with you. (laughs) There's parts I actually wrote that I was thinking of you. (laughs) Oh, cool. (laughs) A lot of the sexual, like I I listened to some of your podcasts with uh, Preston Sprinkle and I've actually listened to quite a bit of your podcast, but uh, just a lot of what you've you've said, it's actually helped make sense of what happened in in, uh, during that time with my having been raised in the purity movement, but also my Middle Eastern culture. So actually a lot of the uh, uh, parts that I kind of describe my interaction with my, when I first met my husband, really you were in the back of my mind. (laughs) Oh, that's so great. All all your voice about the purity movement, all that. So. Oh, that's so wonderful. Okay. Um, To get, to jump into your story, I just want our listeners to know. So Nagma came to national and even international prominence um, because she was campaigning for the release of her husband, Saeed, Ab- how do you say it? Abedini? Abedini, yeah. Abedini um, from an Iranian prison. Uh, he's He was a pastor who was arrested and he was held in prison for three years and then released. But then upon his release, Nagma hit the news again because um, she, she said that he had been abusive towards her and she didn't want to reconcile. So she campaigned to get him released, but then um, they did end up divorcing and Nagma is now telling her story. Um, Nagma grew up in Iran, moved to the United States and then went back to Iran and is now back in the United States. So you've been all over <laughs> the place. And forth, back and forth, yeah. Yes. And I'm going, I, I want to read how you open your book. So this is actually the second paragraph to your book. And you said this, I can't tell you how I was able to make it through because I didn't, I didn't survive. The old me died in the process, burned in the fires of trials. I am not the same person today that I was before. People who have a hard time getting out of an abusive relationship are often those who attempt to drag their old selves, their old ways of thinking through it. I couldn't, I didn't. Like the phoenix rising from the ashes, a new me arose from the catastrophe of my marriage. I love it. So that's where you're coming from. That's how you set the stage. Yeah, it's a confusing title, but that's what it is. It's 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 kind of I describe it as a caterpillar, kind of going into this cocoon. And I, uh, me and the kids actually de- bought some of those kits where you 
get the caterpillars in a little box. Mm -hmm. And when they actually come out of the cocoon, there's blood that comes like it's such a traumatic event that there's blood that drips from that cocoon and then it turns into a butterfly through that struggle. So that's what I would say. I'm no longer a caterpillar. <laughs> yeah. So I, in, in a way I didn't survive. And the Bible says, you know, through the renewing of our mind, we're transformed. So there's a transformation taking uh, place when we're uh, genuine believers and go through trial and we're forced to let go of our old mm -hmm. um, ideas and theology about God and ourselves and really become new in God and really who he is. And a lot of it, uh, also the, the spiritual abuse, a lot of our wrong understanding of who God is and what he wants us to be as Christian women um, had to be, had to really be stripped off of me and renewed by what God actually really says in his word. Okay. And I love how you brought that out. You know, your, your book reads more like a novel, even a suspense novel at times. Like it's, it's, it's really wonderful. I think people it's, it's an easy read, like you won't want to put it down. Um, but it's so fascinating and we can't go over your whole life, but I've picked just a few moments that really meant something to me as we read it that I thought I could ask you to comment on. So, um, first of all, tell me about you and your twin brother coming to Christ the very first time with the radio show. Yeah, we, uh, we, I was raised in war in Iran and my dad had uh, told us we had that radio where you had to tune in the waves and the old radio. And my dad was looking, we were surrounding our dad. We were probably, um, seven or eight, eight years old. And we were kind of looking at our dad as he was trying to find this radio wave where he said his brother was famous in America and, and was going to be on the radio. And so he kept looking for the channel and I guess he figured he hadn't found the right one. So he left the room and me and my brother kept listening and it was a Christian station. And uh, what my dad didn't know at that time, we were very strong Muslims living in Iran, was that his brother had become a Christian. And indeed, he was on a radio, but it was a Christian radio. <laughs> so my dad thought he'd gotten the wrong channel because my uncle is very um he's a he he was he was a very high up engineer in the company Lockheed mm -hmm. um and so my dad kind of thought it would be around that topic I guess so he just um left the room but it was a Christian station but my uncle wasn't on it but there was someone on it that was telling us something that was uh very strange to me and my twin brother which was that God was love and he wanted a relationship with us and we couldn't comprehend that because we kind of grew up in the Islamic revolution and all we were taught at school was that there was a God of wrath and we had to be careful. We had an angel on our right and on our left recording our good or bad. And we just couldn't comprehend a God of love, which is uh, actually, um, if you talk to Muslims, that's a really radical understanding of God is that he's love and he wants a relationship with us. So at that point, we just prayed um, because we speak Farsi, the Persians speak Farsi and uh, in Islam, we were forced to pray in Arabic and read the Quran in Arabic. But for the first time, me and my brother prayed and we said, who, who God show us, like, who are you? And uh, that's how I, we didn't realize it at that time, but that's how the journey kind of started of finding Christ or fi Christ finding us. Because uh, soon after that, my dad said, we're going to America. And we got so distracted by this whole idea of going to a new land and the great Satan, we were taught at school that America was the great Satan. <laughs> so we were very interested to see what this America looked like. <laughs> and, um, and so we forgot about that prayer until we arrived. Yeah. And then you met your uncle and, um, and he... yeah, we, we lived with my uncle. Uh, my, my parents had made a deal with him that there would be no, my, my dad found out he was a Christian. There was, uh, they made a deal that there would be no discussion of God or else mm -hmm. my dad would leave and he would disown him, which he ended up doing. But uh, so we didn't really hear much about God. We kind of, my parents kind of kept us. He had a townhouse and they lived in the first floor and we kind of had a room in the second floor and we were kind of isolated from my uh, uncle's uh, family. But one day my brother had a vision of Jesus and he came running to me and he was crying. And again, um, my brother is very uh, mathematical. He got his doctorate of quantum physics at the University of Chicago. So 
<laughs> uh, seeing him cry and tell me he saw Jesus and Jesus is love really started connecting the dots for us. And we were asking everyone who's Jesus. Finally, uh, we found, Mar uh, well, we spoke Farsi. It was soon after we'd come to America. So not a lot of people understood what we were trying to say. But my uncle, um, when my parents were gone, ended up uh, sharing about uh, God with us and uh, we prayed and then there was a swimming pool in the townhouse and we got baptized <laughs> I love it and then um, I'll fast forward you know over the next few years uh, your family moved you went through a lot of hardships your mother went through depression but eventually your parents also became Christians and so as you're entering your early 20s graduated from university you're desperately wanting to pursue whatever God has for you very committed to the Lord and you end up in Iran again and tell me what the church was like. I found this fascinating how the Holy Spirit was moving in the house church movement yeah. and just growing, exploding. Yeah, I God called me back, strangely enough, um, summer of 2001. There was a few trips back and forth before, like when I was a teenager. But the main call that really impacted with the house church movement was um, soon after, well, summer of 2001, I felt like God was, I was working at a, at a, at a as a receptionist as my, at my church and I felt God and, and I was very involved with youth group and all that. And I felt God saying, you need to go back to Iran. And I couldn't understand it, prayed and fasted. And there was this urge to go back. So I got a ticket for October of 2001. <laughs> and we all know what happened in September. You know what happened? So my parents were like, you heard wrong, please don't go. And my parents were really brand new Christians. And I remember my mom saying, we're baby Christians. Don't do this to us. <laughs> mm -hmm. and let us like, you know, because if you remember, no one wanted to get on, on an airplane after September 11. Uh, people were driving everywhere. Just the mm -hmm. fear of that. And then also there was talks of war in the Middle East. So here I was on an airplane flying into the Middle East. I remember changing my flight to a month later just to give it time to pray um, and if I needed to cancel at that time, the airlines were very understanding, uh, but I, I felt, you know, compelled. I just felt like God was like, nope, this is the timing to go, which I, so I left November of 2001, but I literally arrived um, right at the brink of when the revival was happening and the house church movement was happening. And I got involved. I, I, I was literally at the forefront of this house church movement and I was the pastor's wife and it was growing very quickly. It was uh, it was one of the most exciting times of my life, seeing a move of, move of the Holy Spirit, seeing Muslims. I had not seen Muslims. I worked with refugees here in Boise. I had seen maybe one. Like it was rare to see any Muslim become Christian, and so it was almost like I don't know. I don't know how to uh, compare it to. It's just I just never imagined seeing that much, but with my own eyes, just being the pastor's wife of thousands of Muslims coming to Christ within a few years. And we planted churches in like 33 cities within two years. Yeah. Reading that part of your book, it felt like reading the book of Acts, like just the things the Holy Spirit was doing. And yet at the same time, the Holy Spirit's working and the church is exploding. But this man that you were involved with was not demonstrating the fruits of the spirit in his personal life at all. So can you tell us about Saeed? Like d what made you miss the red flags before you got married? Do you think? I was obsessed with evangelism. I was obsessed with mission mm -hmm. and I, we were a good team, I guess. Um, I, I honestly, I didn't think I could do ministry as a woman. I that I needed. I felt like, I had to be a helper and he seemed uh, to be as passionate for evangelism as me. He was very charismatic. He was uh, a great evangelist, what at least what appeared to me. And so I just, the, the excitement of the ministry really, and I, honestly, I wouldn't have seen what I saw as red flag. Um, mm -hmm. For example, he started questioning my relationship with my sister, who I was close with, my parents, he was saying because he was so spiritual, he had a lot of, uh, he was very um, Pentecostal, charismatic. So I felt like I didn't have that. I grew up in a church where we just read the Bible word by word, and there was not much talk of the Holy Spirit or, you know, and so it, he did seem more spiritual. So he would say, I see issues with your mom, with your dad, with your friends. So he started isolating me, even though they didn't even live in um, Iran, they would visit. 
Uh, but I had friends in Iran that he started isolating me from, relatives in Iran that he started isolating me from, but I didn't see that as abuse. And then he really put down my looks. I never thought I was this amazing, beautiful person, but like, I never thought I was ugly. I was just comfortable in my own skin. And he was just like, oh my gosh, your nose, you need to do surgery, your eyebrows, they need to be lifted. Like, and you're so fat and and so I just like his, his whole family, his whole uh, sisters were like double zero. And I was like a size four and they would call <laughs> me like, oh my gosh, you're so fat. <laughs> and so I just started like, and he hated, he's like, you're dark hair. You need to color it. Um, and you know, because my name means Nagme Shariat Panahi means protect, Nagme protector of Islamic law. Our family's, um, heritage, heritage, my dad would say led back to the prophet of, uh, Islam, Muhammad. So he would say, you're like from Arab blood, you're dark, we're Aryans, we're wider and, you know, and all of that. So he really just, uh, it seemed like, I didn't even know, like in our marriage, I was like, why did he, he even marry me? Like he seemed, um, not attractive to my dark features. And so I didn't see that again as a red flag. I did see things that were like, ah, but again, the excitement of the ministry, the way the church was growing, it was kind of um, made me kind of push my own issues with Saeed. And I would think, you know, I, I was my dad's, um, my dad really paid a lot of attention to me more than my other siblings. He would take me on business trips and he put a lot of confidence in me. Like, you're like me, you're a businesswoman. And so I thought, you know what? I've been a spoiled brat. Probably I expected to be treated like I am very like this amazing person by my spouse. Maybe God's like breaking me of my, of that pride um, by not letting me have that kind of marriage where my husband's like adoring me like my dad did. And mm -hmm. so I just uh, didn't really see it as red flag, but the times I did sense something, I just was like, it's okay. Look at the ministry that's happening. It's fine. Like I would just brush it away. You know, that was one of the interesting things I found in your, in your memoir. And it, it, it came up again and again was how God can be doing these amazing things. And yet at the same time, he was using people whose character really wasn't great. Have you ever been able to reconcile that in your head? Like, how can that happen? Yeah, because uh, I think God is testing our idolatrous hearts. <laughs> I think we can see, uh, honestly, I'm going to share this. I didn't share this in my book. My uncle who um, led me to Christ was ended up not being an amazing a man of uh, character either. And there's issues with him. The one person that kind of told me about Christ and baptized me. Um, so, uh, and so then my husband, then stuff with Franklin that I thought as this amazing, like who's higher than the Grams? It's yes. like, and then it's the Grams. Yes. And we'll get to Franklin Graham yeah. in a minute. Everybody. So, yes. <laughs> I think God allows broken, even, um, I would say even evil, you know, people that might not be saved. You know, we look at Balaam and Balak, the prophet and the new Testament calls, is it Balak? That was the prophet that he called the, the, the Bible calls him evil actually. But God used that prophet to prophesy blessing over Israel. So some, uh, I think God is testing our idolatrous heart. There's people that are doing great works that in the last days, they will tell Jesus, we did all these great works. They call it Jesus, Lord, Lord, we did all this great work. We did miracles. I mean, what's bigger than a miracle? Dead rising, uh, mm -hmm. healing. And Jesus says, get away from me. I never knew you, you men of lawlessness. So we are idol we are idolater uh, idolaters at in our hearts and so when someone does great things we hang on to them and we worship them and we throw money at them we throw adoration at them and that they're not supposed to be getting that if they're true men and women of god they would say no don't give me that i don't want that like the apostles did in the new testament they, and but they like to receive it they like to receive the monies and the attentions and the glory and that's how you can tell that they're probably false because a true servant of God would not try to be a middle person. They would be like, don't look at me. It's him. Like, it's not about me. It's not about my platform. It's not about, you know, so there's a lot of middle people, I would say between us and Christ. Now there's a lot of people that are gaining a lot of money and uh, attention by just doing great works. And it's testing our, our idolatrous hearts where, uh, why are we giving glory to man when it's God, you know, God can work through donkeys and evil yeah. people. <laughs> Do we worship donkeys if they they talk? Maybe we would. <laughs> <laughs> good point. Good point. So um, after you, you married, 
very soon if your marriage got abusive, although you wouldn't have named it as such, you said. So uh, you, you described sexual assault. Uh, you described a horrific beating that he gave you um, one night in a hotel room. A few years later, he beat your father. Um, so this was my dog destroyed property. Yeah. yeah it, it kept escalating. Yeah. The beating happened about a year and a half into our marriage. And that's probably the first time I thought I, 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 to be honest, I probably thought this is abuse. Like I, I wouldn't have put abuse, but this is like not okay because, um, again, I wouldn't have put abuse to it because I, I, I guess in my mind, I was talking back to him. He was very tired. We were both tired. I was pregnant. We had just fled Iran. We were in Dubai and I was, we were unpacking and Saeed is, is very OCD. <laughs> Everything has to be organized. And I was throwing clothes, looking for my pajamas. And he said, you're making a mess. And I said, who cares? And I was, and he beat, I almost nearly died. It was that bad. Um, again, but at that time I was pregnant uh, early in our um, engagement. He had crossed sexual boundaries. I felt like uh, there was a few times I almost pulled out, but I felt like I'm damaged goods. He had for the first time, he had me touch his private. He had, uh, you know, we would take off our clothes. We would do a lot of things that were not necessarily sex, but by, but he really pushed a lot of sexual boundaries where I just felt coming from the Middle Eastern culture and also the um, purity movement. I just felt like I belonged to him because he's already crossed so many lines. Like no mm -hmm. other man would want me in my mind from the purity culture. I was thinking I shouldn't, I had never held hands with anyone. I had never kissed anyone. Said was every, all of that. So I, in my mind, I thought, Oh, now he's done that. I belong to him. Like no other man would want me. I'm tainted. And um, so he crossed a lot of sexual boundaries and then the beating really started. Uh, I mean, there was a, some um, physical stuff, which I describe in the book where he would have me beg and mm -hmm. uh, um, he would isolate me and he would um, give me the silent treatment. He would push me around, but it wasn't like, it was just like push shove. It wasn't like the full on beating. So I was confused. And so, but the, the first beating happened, yeah, in uh, about a year and a half in our marriage, end of 2005, we were married summer of 2004. Right. And then from there, things just escalated. You caught him using porn and he tried to hide it, but then he stopped hiding it. He would just use it while you were in the room. Even when your parents were in the room, he just didn't care. So his behavior is, is getting worse and worse, but at the same time, he's on staff at churches in the U S he's, you the know, church. Supposed yeah, our church yeah. here. He was the yeah. on staff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. he, wow. Never, they know that he's, he's watching porn. Yeah. So really problematic behaviors, obviously. Um, and how, how are you trying to make sense of your marriage in those days before prison? Uh, that I was going to be this amazing, godly woman that I had strived to be. So I was going to do my part of the contract of uh, ob obedience to the Bible. So I was going to honor him. I was going to obey my husband. I was going to submit to him. And then if he didn't, if he didn't hold up to his, his part of the bargain of loving me and treating me right, that was between him and God. But I was going to please God by um, obeying the Bible myself, that no matter what, I was going to submit to him and just treat him right even if when he didn't treat me right and I just saw it as a hard marriage um but I, I, there were times where you know I've always uh, shared the gospel with Muslims there was times that I would literally be sharing the gospel with Muslim women and they would be tell, telling me their story of their husband's porn addictions and beating <laughs> and I would say oh my that's my marriage what do <sighs> I have to say to them like do I say like Christian marriage is different? Like it, I remember a few times I was like, wow, their marriage is so much like mine. And, you know, and I'm like, I'm supposed to be in a Christian marriage and they're in a Muslim marriage where they're allowed, they're treated like the, the Quran actually says their property and they're supposed to be beaten. And so um, those were times where I start thinking, wow, this is a strange how my marriage is so similar to a non-believer. But I just thought it was a hard marriage and I was just going to honor God by obeying my part of the contract, I guess, obedience and submission to my mm -hmm. husband. Wow. And then in those years, of course, you and your husband were arrested multiple times, but you were let go. Um, and then 
at one of the low points in your marriage, you're remaining in the U.S. He goes back to Iran to start the orphanage. And while there, he gets arrested. Yes. Um, and he's in prison. And that's when you went into overdrive <laughs> uh, to raise awareness about... Get him out, to get my visa out. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's, it's, it's so confusing to people. Yes. So at that time, I literally was a shell of a person. I, I remember one of my interviews so vividly saying it's hard for me to make decisions. I would process everything with my husband. I, I literally said that in some of my first interviews because I literally could not make a decision without Saeed. He mm -hmm. had, was, had, I was a shell of a person. I didn't, re I didn't um, believe in my own thinking. I was afraid things I was going to say was going to be stupid and wrong. Uh, even when I would read scripture and I would tell Saeed something, he would say, oh, you're so limited in your understanding. This is I even felt like I lacked understanding reading the Bible. And to be honest, I had stopped reading the Bible and I had stopped really having much of a relationship with God and my um, wanting to submit to and obey my husband. He had become Lord. I really didn't have much of a connection with mm -hmm. Jesus anymore uh, in terms of I was saved, but I was not praying as much or reading the Bible, but I had become a shell of a person where Saeed was, had decided, could, had decided like what I would wear, um, the amount of makeup I would put on, which was a lot, the clothes, he questioned my clothes. So he got to choose what, uh, what I wore friends. I saw. So literally when he went to prison, I was like, what do I do? I was trained to be controlled by him. I had no idea like how to function because I had to, because I had learned to get permission from him to do everything. Literally, even the kids play dates, I would run by him. Like, can they play with this person today? They only could play with like certain cousins uh, once a month for two hours, for example, everything was controlled. It might sound insane, but that's how it was. So when he went to prison, I start having to think for myself and I did my first interview. Um, you know, you said, you know, um, um, we'll get to that part, but the first time I went to media to try to get him out, the second time the abuse stuff went to media it was actually not me. It was leaked. Mm -hmm. Um, so, but I just, I waited six months. I prayed and fasted and I thought he's going to get out. Like they're going to let him out. Uh, but after six months, it became clear that they were going to keep him there for a long time. And actually he might die, uh, in the prison. And so we decided with his family, with his parents, with his sisters, we decided to go to media. Of course I would go to media because they were afraid to go to media because the Iranian government would not like that. And their, their life could be in threatened. So as a single mom, I went to media and it just blew up from there. It just, mm -hmm. I thought I did so bad on the media because I was looking at a camera pretending I was talking to Hannity on Fox News. It was uh, because the cameras were at my house. I wasn't able to, <laughs> the request to be on the news was so fast that I didn't have time to be in a studio. So there was cameras in my home and I had to look at a camera and pretend I was talking to a person and I had like my earpiece where the producer was saying stuff in my ear. So I thought I did so bad. And then people were like, you're so pretty. You did so good. You're so well spoken. Like, <laughs> what? Like that was the first time in a long time I had been affirmed of my looks, of the way I spoke. And that was the beginning to my freedom as I was stepping into advocating for Saeed to release him from his prison. I was in this cocoon. I was fighting to get her. I was actually develop getting wings and to fly. I was actually strengthening god was strengthening my relationship with him and giving giving me my identity in him to be um just confident to be able to sit before obama and to sit before trump and to go to congress and express my faith in jesus and you know god really used Saeed's imprisonment to share the gospel which was the what i've always as an evangelist that's been like my greatest desire has been to share the gospel but god used Saeed's imprisonment not only to share the gospel in front of millions and hundreds of millions, actually, but to also set me free, which I didn't see it at that time. So why did I advocate for him? Because my little God was really missing. Like I was so dependent on Saeed. I wanted to get him out, but also I never imagined life as a single mom. I think that was one of my fears. And I also, what Iran did was wrong. Like I was born Muslim. I went to Iran as a Christian. I got to see how Christians are hunted down, killed, and imprisoned. And so I got to see persecution with my own eyes. So this upside being in prison gave me an opportunity to be vocal. Like, 
this is what's happening in Muslim countries. This is what's happening in Iran. Like Christians are haunted down. They're like, and uh, and a lot of these countries like Iran say they have religious freedom. So actually it gave me a platform to be a voice for the voiceless, for the many Christians, hundreds of thousands of Christians inside of Iran that are killed and imprisoned and given the death sentence simply for being a Christian. So those were the good things that came out of it. But yeah, I fought for him because what Iran had done was wrong. Also, he, he they should not be imprisoning Christians. Yeah. And it was wrong. And you rose, you, you rose awareness for all of the other Christians who were imprisoned for the same thing. I mean, I think it was really, it was noble. I, I remember watching you back then and thinking how poised you were. And, you know, um, it's amazing how you had such low self-esteem and you couldn't see who you really were. Your dad so, saw it. It's so clear that your dad saw it. My you know, dad it, did. I, he, this is, you know, a lot of times people think abusers go for that low self-esteem, mm -hmm. low, like I was middle, upper middle class. I had a high self-esteem. I didn't, again, I didn't think I was like amazingly, I just didn't think about my looks. I just was confident. My dad had really poured that into me. And so it really went from pretty high self-confidence to zero. Yeah. And I think a lot of times abusers, uh, people like me, uh, people that do have confidence that are actually uh, not what we typically think are abused women, and that that becomes like a goal for them to break them down. So it's not always actually a lot of times it's not what we who we typically think would be an abused woman, someone from poor, you know, uh, low self esteem kind of a person. But uh, a lot of times it's not that's not the case. It's really abuse is goes across all economic and you know lines and all of that so yeah absolutely okay so he's in prison and you are out there you're speaking to the you know at the UN you're speaking in Europe you're speaking in Congress you're speaking everywhere you're going all over the place to raise awareness um and at the same time Saeed gets a phone yes. and he's and he's able to talk to you and at first the conversations are good, but they take a turn once you start getting famous. And tell us about that turn. Yes, at first they're good. At first I'm shocked that he even has a phone in maximum security, one of the worst prisons in Iran. Like what the heck? He would, <laughs> his parents helped him get the money to the smugglers. It was like each cell phone was like, each cell phone was like $7,000. Crazy number. Um, amount of money for a cell phone but he got access to a smartphone about two and a half years into his imprisonment and at first he seemed nice and I was like wow like our marriage is gonna work because before he left it was so bad and uh and then the attack started he saw I was meeting with Obama and Trump and he saw that I was um on like um mega churches and uh, you know, churches of 30,000, they had invited, they would invite me to different conferences to speak. And so he also saw that I was not the woman that when he went to prison, he saw a different woman, he saw a confident woman. Uh, and he started attacking me at that time. I didn't understand why he started attacking me, but he was saying, you're a whore, you're Jezebel. Don't think they're clapping for you. Don't be so confident. They're clapping for me. It's my name, Saida Bedini, that they're clapping for. And once I come out, I'm going to divorce you, which he did. I'm going to divorce you and no one's going to care about you. It's all about me. And so he really wanted to make sure I was a nobody, which I didn't understand why um, until later that he saw my confidence building and he needed to crush it so he could, could still control me. And I literally became a slave. I, I Every money I made went to all of his family. Uh, people yeah, think this I part I found unbelievable. So his family, a lot of them are living with you. You're mm -hmm. cooking and cleaning and doing everything for them at the same time as you're doing all this stuff. And he's making you pay their cell phone bills and for them to go on vacation. Oh, uh, he had his mom and dad and then his older sister lived in the, his mom and dad would travel back and forth to Iran and Turkey because Turkey, they had to say had two siblings living in Turkey uh, as refugees, they had to flee as well. And then his older sister left, lived in America. And uh, also, I think maybe part of it is the Middle Eastern culture. The older son is responsible in some ways. But I was not, I was responsible for grown people in like their late 20s, early 30s. Um, 
they, his sister was going to college and she was in her early thirties and I was responsible to send like $3,000, $5,000 for her to go on spring break or summer vacation or whatever. If when they were not with me, they were usually with me or traveling with me, all of their trips back and forth, their living expenses, their iPads, computers, cell phones, anything they got plus pocket money was supposed to come from me. I remember one time Saeed even called and said, my sister and brother in Turkey, they haven't had, they only eat steak one, once a week. Like he wanted me to pay enough money so they could go to nice restaurants as refugees and enjoy life in Turkey. And so here I'm paying for living expenses in Turkey for them. I mean, it was just every money. And you I, don't have very much money. Like you're, no, you're people you're, don't realize like, um, <laughs> ACLJ was my lawyers who advocate for Said. People donated mostly to them, which went on to lawyer costs. So mm -hmm. it didn't go to me. Uh, Franklin Graham av advocated for me, but a lot of the money went to Franklin Graham's organization to advocate for me. So it didn't come to me. Also, um, you know, some people sent the money directly to the church, but it wasn't a lot. Maybe it was like, let's say um, at, at max, maybe 50,000 had been raised, but all of that went to Saeed's mom. Anytime she went to the doctor, I had to pay all the medical bills, emergency rooms, like all of it. I have like receipts from the church. None of it I received for myself or the kids. Like all of it went to their expenses because I was responsible for their medical bills, everything. And so I, people don't realize like literally I was still driving an old van <laughs> when I was advocating for Said. I didn't buy myself a new car and I was living with my parents mm -hmm. at right now. Um, and so I didn't really get rich of it, rich off of it to buy this amazing house or uh, again, like even the house I'm at right now is my parents' house. So people don't realize I did not get rich off of advocating for Said. Mm -hmm. Um, and I did pay off a house we had that we had rented um, and I had paid that off, which we had to sell when the divorce became final. And majority mm -hmm. of what I got from the house went to lawyer costs. I had to yeah. pay my lawyer over $50,000 because I dragged this whole divorce out so much. So, but yeah, I didn't, I didn't get rich. I, but I was a slave. I was literally making money to pay for Said and his whole entire family. He had a few $7,000 cell phones because they kept confiscating it and throwing him in solitary confinement. So I had to keep raising seven, like collecting 7,000, sending it. So like in the course of the year that he had a cell phone, he probably changed, he, they probably confiscated his phone four or five times. That's like $30,000 just on right. a cell phone. So people don't realize the, uh, that, but I was a slave. I was working for them to have a comfortable life. Right. So here you are, you're advocating as, as hard as you can. You're doing all of these interviews. You're, you know, traveling wherever you can talk and raise awareness, but you're also paying for his family. And at the same time, he's on the phone telling you that you're a whore and a Jezebel. Jezebel, that's his favorite word. <laughs> right. Um, and there came to be a breaking point where you were, you were supposed to go to a speaking engagement. You didn't think you could do it. You were sitting down with a pastor and everything just poured out of you. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, I, I had stopped talking to Said. I had drawn my first boundary. I had said, Said, don't call me if you're going to be mean to me. And so he had stopped calling me. So people uh, who understand about emotional connection or emotional attachment, it was so hard for me not to talk to Said. So I had a week of not talking to him, but he kept still sending messages, emojis through Skype, like throw up emoji or like you're disgusting, you're a Jezebel, but I wasn't responding. And so... I finally broke and I said, I don't understand. I'm advocating for him. I was, it was at a big church, mega church in North Carolina, past, uh, pastor David Chadwick's church. And I finally broke in front of him, him and his wife. I said, I don't know why he's calling me names because pastor Chadwick would always say, your husband must be so proud of you. Mm -hmm. And I, I was like, no, he's actually calling me names. I don't get it. I'm trying to get him out and I'm struggling. Um, and he said, you're an abused wife. I I literally told him everything and I just cried and I just because having been raised in the Christian culture of not airing dirty laundry but also Middle Eastern culture you don't talk about your personal marriage issues I had held everything in and I just told him everything I could remember 
-hmm. And he looked at me and he said, you know what? I'm not just the pastor. I'm a psychologist. I have a doctorate in psychology and you're an abused wife. And that's when I find, I got the diagnosis that I was not just in a hard marriage, but I was actually an abused wife. Wow. And shortly thereafter, you sent an email to your supporters explaining all of this and someone leaked that to the media. Yes. I looked up abuse, which mm -hmm. I think for a lot of people, when they look up abuse is when it comes to light what they're under. I think a lot of times your body's telling you you're under abuse, even though you don't fully understand it. So I looked up the word abuse and everything was like a playbook. Like it seemed like Said had followed this or the book people had written or the internet material had like looked at our lives and people have written off of our lives. So when I realized like, wow, this is everything that's in my marriage from physical to emotional to psychological, from the isolation to the, um, uh, the silent treatment, they're all abuse. <clears throat> I broke, I had a literally, I, I, a, you know, emotional breakdown. And I wrote an email to a group of supporters that had always been faithful in keeping my secrets. I was able, before I would be able to tell these group of supporters things I was going through and it had never been leaked. And so I thought there are people that love Saeed, but they've been like my backbone in a way. They've supported mm -hmm. me through this. I told them like, I am an abused wife. And um, within hours, it had been leaked to media and I was just getting calls from Franklin Graham and ACLJ and Washington Post and Christianity Today. I was just like, getting so many calls trying to get me to comment on that. Right. And, and many people wanted you to retract, um, telling you that you were the one harming the cause of Christ instead of saying, no, Saeed was harming, harming the cause of Christ. Yeah. Initially there's people that, uh, a lot of people said, just a lot of my advisors said, say that you were um, mentally, you've been on medication. <laughs> right. And uh, you didn't mean to say it. You've been under a lot of stress. And I said, no, I think I'm finally getting clarity and I'm not on medication. Um, but uh, Franklin, as, as I've shared, and there's voice messages and there's emails to back that, um, really tried to bully me into silence and said that I was damaging the cause of Christ. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which I find so heartbreaking. So um, shortly thereafter, he is released. He doesn't call you when he's released. No, he calls I told family. him not to call me if he couldn't be nice. So he didn't call me. <laughs> right. So he's released. He doesn't call you. The media is waiting to see your rec your, your, your reunion and it doesn't happen. You that can't get to Germany because so you don't have your passport. All these things happen. And Franklin Graham is trying to get you to come and you just don't feel right about it. You don't feel safe. Tell me about um, your, your uh, email to Anne Graham Lotz. Well, initially he wanted me to fly to Germany to see Said, and I there was reasons for that I couldn't go because uh, taking kids out of the country, Said would have a lot of power. And mm -hmm. then because Said had threatened um, to take the kids, and then Franklin really convinced me to go to the Billy Graham uh, Retreat Center in North Carolina, and it was January, end of January of 2016, and I agreed. As I was packing, I just felt like. God was just like, there was something I was sick to the bit of my stomach. And I said, God, give me a confirmation. I'm not supposed to go. And Anne Graham calls me. And of course she also sent an email that I, that is out there. Mm -hmm. And she basically, she said, don't go. Like, why, why do you care about the Graham name so much? Like, we're not God. Like, mm -hmm. like, you know, and she basically was like, don't listen to Franklin. He's not, you know, he doesn't get it. He doesn't. And, and for our listeners, Anne Graham lots is, is Franklin Graham's sister and both Franklin and Anne are Billy Graham's children. Just for, yes, for yes. clarification. And Graham Lotz yes. is Franklin's sister mm -hmm. and Billy Graham's daughter, which mm -hmm. a lot of times, I guess, Billy Graham said that she's the most like him. Yeah. <laughs> she, um, yeah, she said, don't go. And she said, made some interesting comments about Franklin that was, that mm -hmm. media has shared, but um, yeah. she really was God's confirmation uh, through her phone call is what saved me because she said, you're going to retreat with little cell reception. She's like, I've been there. It's and, and it's winter. There's so much snow. There was a snowstorm. She said, you're about 50 miles from anywhere and you're going to be alone with your abuser. Like she yeah. said, you get this. <laughs> and mm -hmm. she really explained things to me and um, helped me see it, which was very brave of her because 
she was, on, she, I don't know if she still is, but she was on Franklin Graham's boards with Samaritan Purse mm -hmm. and the Billy Graham. And so to, you know, it would have affected her own um, livelihood mm -hmm. going against her brother, but she, she, God really used her to confirm to me that I, I should not go. And that's when Franklin really turned on me. I mean, before then he'd already turned on me. Uh, mm -hmm. The moment the abuse broke out, he called me an adulteress. The moment I got out of prison, he said, there's two sides to every story. Don't just believe Nagme's side. Um, and he'd already said things, but the moment I re literally refused to go to North Carolina, he became, I became his number one enemy because I had not listened to him. Right. And then um, you did end up having a meeting with him. Uh, you took your lawyer and your pastor. Um, and that meeting was recorded. I've listened to the recording twice. I listened to it when it first released and then I listened to it earlier this week. Um, to say it is infuriating is an understatement mm -hmm. because Franklin Graham said that his purpose was just reconciliation because that was best for you and he just wanted that to happen. Mm -hmm. but he spent the majority of that conversation talking and didn't and let you talk me. and attacking you mm -hmm. and even attacking scripture when you read it saying oh, that it he wasn't didn't applicable me to read scripture yes he didn't want me to read scripture and at one point you read <laughs> the ephesians i think it's the five passages first corinthians read. first corinthians 5 verses 9 through 13 where it says you don't associate with the yes. brother who calls and so he didn't want me to read that. He's like, I don't know. And, yeah, and then when you did, he said that doesn't apply to marriage. So the passage says, don't, don't, don't associate, you know, do not even the eat abusers. with them. With yeah. And he said that doesn't apply to marriage. No. Um, and the and entire he, time he called me a liar and defended Saeed's honesty. Yes. Yeah. It was, it was really unbelievable. It was, a, it was a difficult conversation to oh. listen to. I was so proud of you though. <laughs> I can say, uh, I've given advice to abuse women in this way. I would not have recorded if my abuse counselor had not said record it and take mm -hmm. two witnesses because Franklin had used the smallest thing to say to media, knock me, doesn't want the marriage to work. Well, they said, he's going to come out of this, that meeting. He's going to twist things. And then you have no proof what you said and what you didn't say. So mm -hmm. record it. And Franklin knew I was recording. There was no hiding it. Mm -hmm. The phone was on the table. And, um, and also I had two witnesses. So I am so glad I did that. I am so glad I did that. But you can see with Franklin knowing that there's two witnesses, it's not just me and him. Mm -hmm. Whereas before that be just me and him, he was a much bigger bully. There's not just me and him. There's two witnesses, lawyer and my pastor. So mm -hmm. lawyer means he has to really be careful what he says. And it's being recorded. Still, Franklin acted so crazy on that uh, recording. This yeah. is him knowing that it's being recorded and there's two witnesses next to me. And still Franklin said things that is just unbelievable. Yeah, that abuse is when a man comes home drunk and hits his wife. Every night, his... every night. Yes. He'd yeah. actually mentioned to my pastor, he if it doesn't have, happen often, it's probably not abuse. The woman was probably sassy and talking back. But even then he talks about how that those kind of marriages were the man beats his wife every night. He, he, I guess, reconciled the husband and wife. And he yes. the husband eventually ended up in an altercation with police and shot mm -hmm. up, shot up police or something. Mm -hmm. So he's like, yeah, he saved this marriage with this abuser that nearly sh killed someone. The, and he's proud of it. Of yeah, it was, marriage. it was very, very, very bad. And you kept to your main point. This is what I thought was so good is that you only had one main point and you kept saying it over and over and your pastor kept saying it over and over, which is the only thing that you want is safety and for Saeed to show that he's serious about not abusing you anymore. And yes. you had things for him to do, which is see these two abuse counselors. Those are the, that's the only thing you asked for. And over and over again, Franklin Graham was telling you that you needed to compromise, that what were you going to do to restore the marriage? You know, you need to understand there needs to be give and take. And it's like, it's just, it's unbelievable. And I called them out on calling me the cheater while Saeed was the cheater. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there was silence there. I think, I think that's where he actually got mad and looked at my pastor and said, why didn't you tell me who Saeed was when I called Franklin out for calling me a cheater while Saeed yeah. had actually the, the woman he was advocating for at that point on his social media was the woman he had been cheating with 
um, with during our marriage. So yeah, so Franklin, knowing that Said had confessed adultery to him, beating me, whatever he confessed, he still was bullying me. What are you going to do? Mm -hmm. And it was clear that Franklin was not after your best interests. He was only after the marriage being restored so that uh, the reputation of the work. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I don't honestly even think it was. Yeah. He maybe thought it was the reputation of Christianity or the cause of Christ. But I think he really, it was his own reputation. He had backed Saeed and also Mm -hmm. he had sent a lot of, he'd spent a lot of money on our family and he was making a documentary that I had signed the rights over to him for Saeed's life. And he'd already sent people filming and he'd already pretty much made the documentary. And so I think it was damaging a lot of his pocket and uh, mm-hmm. also his own reputation of having backed sight, but people would have understood if he said, I didn't know. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, which is interesting years later, last year, Washington post uh, interviewed him again. And that's six years later after the incident, he said, they asked him like, you called Nagme an adulteress, like on a phone call. And he said, yep. And I would do it again. <laughs> he wow. did not backtrack. He did not say, you know, Oh, I didn't understand abuse. I am, you know, I'm sorry. He dug his heel in deep, even deeper. <laughs> you know, I, I was at an event last week and there was a woman there um, who was, who was supposed to go directly from the event. So she was talking to me afterwards to her church because the elders had called her in to have a meeting with her and her husband because she was supposed to apologize to her husband. And she was explaining to me the dynamics in the marriage and the husband had been really abusive And had been complaining that she wasn't obeying him. And so the elders had called her in so that she could apologize. And I remember saying to her, you don't have to go. Wow. They don't have your best interests at heart. But she was saying, you know, but my husband hasn't talked to me. This is the only way to get my husband to talk to me. And so I said, you need to take an advocate. You know, do not ever go into that alone. And, And I just thought, you know, you handled it really well. And I know you got coaching before that meeting of what to do, which was, which was so helpful, but so many women get pulled into these meetings where they get bullied by people who are not interested in their safety or their well being. Yes. Bring They're, an advocate, bring two, bring two witnesses. The Bible says. or, or you don't even have to go. You don't have to go. Nope. That you was my, that was my go. thing. I told uh, Franklin and Said really pushed me for a meeting. Franklin was in Boise for decision America tour. And I said, you know what? I will not come unless I have two witnesses and I record it. Mm-hmm. Like that's my agreement. So I, I highly recommend that. And I was coached. So a lot of things people don't know. I have another recording that's not as I had met with Saeed and I had recorded and I had brought two witnesses. So I had a, a trial one practice before this. Mm-hmm. And Saeed had said things he had like, as my abuser, ab- abuse counselor said, he had thrown things and I had taken the bait. He had thrown things. And I, so I shared that tape recording with my abuse counselor. And he's like, not me. Don't talk much. Don't take the bait. Like he coached mm-hmm. me through the mistakes I made in that meeting. Mm-hmm. And so the one with Franklin, I had already failed once <laughs> with <laughs> a private meeting with Saeed with two um, counselor, two uh, witnesses that I had brought, but he'd also brought a number of people. So, um, so yeah, I just suggest like, be careful not to uh, take the bait and go like, and don't throw up your pearls before pigs. Like what's precious to you, you're throwing before people who don't not only will not understand it, but will attack you and yeah, don't go to those meetings. Um, and if you do go with advocates, go with people that get abuse that can stand up for you. And, uh, I, I highly suggest recording it in some way because, people twist so much of what you say and uh, they can use it against you. And I do need to say legally that sometimes you can't record without the other's permission in certain states. So we just want to say that, but yes, yes, yes. But you can make that a condition of the meeting. Yes. That's what I did. I made that as a condition for the meeting. I said, Mm -hmm. I will meet if you guys have nothing to hide, like I'm going to bring two witnesses and I will record. And if, if that's not okay with you guys, then I don't have to meet. I don't really need to meet. Yeah. And then there was other things that Franklin Graham was involved in. He sent Saeed with in, in, with bodyguards and like a whole contingent to your house with with no warning when there was a protection order. I mean, th- this was this was really bullying behavior. Mm-hmm. Um, 
on Franklin Graham's part and really, really problematic. Sometimes churches just get stuff wrong, just like Franklin Graham got stuff wrong. And we at Bare Marriage, one of our main goals is educating people on what is healthy, what is evidence-based, and what is biblical. Let's look at what the data says, because Jesus said that a good tree can't bear bad fruit and a bad tree can't bear good fruit. So if you want a way to talk to your pastor, your small group leader, your women's ministry leader about how some of the things that they're teaching don't line up with scripture and might actually be taught toxic, please take a look at our Great Sex Rescue Toolkit. I've priced it so low, it's just pay what you can. So for those who can't afford a lot, it's like $3. But if you can afford to pay more, then you can give more to support what we're doing here at Bear Marriage. So take a look at that. It's filled with handouts and lots of information on how you can talk to your church or others in your community about how to help the evangelical church get more in line with what Jesus wanted. But he rose above it. Saeed ended up being the one to initiate the divorce, uh, didn't he? And he he divorced me. Yeah. And, uh, and after I asked him for uh, to get help on the abuse, he was done. Someone mm-hmm. told me that. Um, I think it's a mutual friend, maybe Tom Pride. Yes. He yes. told me he's like, not mate. The moment you draw boundaries, he will divorce you. I was like, no, he won't. He's going to fight for our marriage. He's like, not mate. The moment you draw boundaries, you're no longer going to be his slave. He Mm -hmm. only wants a slave. He does not want someone with opinions. And I didn't believe Tom Pride. And then the moment I said, you have to get help on your abuse, he filed for divorce the next day, like within, within days of it. Right. So that's now settled and you're, you're raising your kids and, um, you've had some heartbreaks since your father passed away of COVID. Um, and I'm so sorry about that. Yeah. Because he was through some, uh, depression, anxiety, uh, to a point where I couldn't function at all. And so just, I, I think it was good for me. It really slowed me down to process everything because um, it really helped me to process the war or coming to like a lot of things in my life. I hadn't really sat down to process that time where I was um, depressed and couldn't really do anything. I was processing my life with God and really thinking and taking it to God for prayer. There was a lot of healing that happened during that time, actually. Mm -hmm. Um, I want to read one paragraph from the book where you're talking about the unwanted divorce and what happened when your, when your marriage broke down. And you said this, when God helped me to see that it was biblical to create boundaries with Saeed because of the abuse and adultery, I discovered that God cares more about the person within an institution such as marriage than about trying to keep the institution intact. This was a revelation to me. Jesus came to save people, not institutions. God reminded me that when Jesus was on earth, many of the religious leaders had been so concerned about keeping the Sabbath day that they actually objected when Jesus healed people on the Sabbath. Their man-made rules for the Sabbath became more important to them than the well-being of suffering people, and they failed to understand these words of God spoken by the prophet Hosea, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. That was the biggest revelation that set me free, and God showed it to me through uh, Sabbath that institutions mm-hmm. whether they fall they fall like marriage church pastor has sin like it falls to pieces like god's like oh no i don't want the institution mm-hmm. god yeah. is not worried about that i mean he revealed david's sin and he was david was a king he cares about the person it always goes back to the person and we try so hard to keep institutions intact like churches and like oh no people can't find out about this pastor has done that it's going to destroy the church yeah. oh well if the institution was put there, not if, the institution of marriage church, it was put there to protect, to nourish, that people would flourish under it, would thrive under it, not die under it, and not like um, shrivel under it, but instead thrive and to be who God called them to be. So if it's not protecting, if it's not nourishing, and if it's not literally, if you're the head and according to the Bible, if you're not being a slave, literally... Mm-hmm washing the feet of the person you're supposed to be the head of Mm -hmm. you know people that believe in 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 that and and if you're not literally serving them to thrive and to be the best person they can be and to you're not protecting them and you're not nourishing them and you're not feeding them then let the institution fall apart If, if a marriage is causing a life harm 
uh, and a lot of times it might not be physical, but because of the emotional and spiritual, all of that, and the sexual stuff you talk about, um, uh, if the person uh, develops autoimmune, they're literally, or uh, they feel dead inside, like I did before Said went to prison, then what is that institution worth if it's not representing Christ to us, if, if it's a church or a marriage? then why are we protecting it so much? And really, I a lot of times people say, what do you have to say to pastors or people that are in these institutions? Why are you so afraid of this stuff coming out? Are you so, And why are you so afraid of the marriage falling apart or the church falling apart? Um, and, and, are you, and so a lot of times because people are afraid of the church uh, falling apart or the marriage, they silence the, the abuse. And because they think they're doing God a favor by protecting the institution, that's not the God. That's not the God of the Bible. The God of the Bible is for the weak, is for the person. And if the institution falls apart, let it fall apart. Amen. <laughs> um, I really enjoyed the end of your book where you're talking about where you are now. I found it fascinating how you're someone who, you know, you always wanted to be an evangelist and you're, you're really spanning two cultures. So you're seeing the American megachurch Christian culture, but you're also seeing the explosion of the church in Iran, which is largely women led. Um, yes. <laughs> Do you guys realize how radical this is in a country mm -hmm. that has been run by Islam for 1400 years where women are second class citizens, literally called property by the Quran. These women that have been so crushed in society are leading and men are honoring them in that leadership. Like, mm -hmm. do you guys realize how radical that is for the Middle East? Like it's pretty <laughs> radical. It would be radical for America, <laughs> but this is really radical for the Middle East, for women to be leading and for men to be honoring that position of leadership and women. Yeah, I love it. Yeah. Um, and more recently, you've made some critiques of the American church. Uh, do you want to tell us about what you found out about a single mom at your church who went to get help? <laughs> you were part of that drama. I was. I you sent you what? a message on that one. Still, it's interesting. <laughs> I, I kept reading your message. And I, I at first I was like, no, I'm not part of a toxic church. Come on. I've known these people for 20 some <laughs> years. I'm not part of that church anymore. I don't know if I told you. No, no. I, it took me a while to reach that conclusion. I had known these leaders leaders for so long. And um, I just couldn't believe that they could like be enabling things. And so we had a single mom that went to our church for um, help. She was about to be homeless. And this is a woman that goes to Sundays, Wednesdays, serves at the church, had been homeless before where she slept in her car and her kids were in different homes because of that. And she was terrified of it. And one of our pastors saw that. And instead of raising funds for her, well, she was given 200, $250 and said, don't ask for any more handouts. Mm -hmm. And this is going to be the last time we help you. Like, don't come back. And at the same time, uh, one of our pastors was raising $75,000 to go to Europe with his family on a mission trip. Right. At the same time, our I, I got a hold of our church pie chart and our church has an income of $5 million. And that really blew my mind. And, uh, you know, I've always thought my, my, the house church movement and the work of the Holy Spirit in Iran, that I went through the abuse, I never connected it all. And God started connecting it all to me. It's like, well, you saw how the Holy Spirit moves in the house churches, how women are honored. There's really even like my, how I met Saeed, I met him in a building church. He was one of the worship leaders and house churches. You have to minister to 10, 15 people. And the first person to be arrested and tortured is the shepherd. We, we, you know, and so not a lot of narcissists want to lead house churches. It's a lot of, <laughs> a lot of yeah, <laughs> you're the first to go. You're literally laying down your life for the sheep. You don't get a book deal. You don't get money. You don't get fame. You don't. And so I was, I was putting two and two together of why are we seeing this in Iran and in America, we're seeing such an epidemic. And yes, I criticize, or, you know, my hope is uh, healing for the church. I think that's why you speak mm -hmm. is I realize it's the whole structure. It's, we have this structure that a few on top serve um, and the rest of the body of Christ is sitting. We're sitting in wheelchairs. And now, after, you know, after, let's say after 20, 30 years, someone you're sitting in a wheelchair and someone says, get up and walk. You can't. Your legs have not been moving. And so we have a paralyzed body of Christ with a few serving at top. 
we're throwing like idols, we're throwing money at them. They're really rich. They're doing really mm -hmm. well while, while the poor and the single moms are, uh, are wasting away, which that's not the early church. And that's not the church in Iran, in Iran, you know, the, the Bible says the book of Acts, like, um, that no one was in need. Like we, everyone took care of each other from the money that came in, but in the American church, 80% of the money that comes in goes to the church, to the building, to keep the, keep the four shows a Sunday going, uh, 80% goes there and whatever the, else is left over to goes to other things. And it's just not biblical. The way we've, um, we have been, uh, doing church is so opposite of the Bible yeah. and it's allowing for abusers to thrive and it's silencing the abused, which is so opposite of the heart of God. I actually had a speaker's, uh, I guess Lance Ford, he wrote something called unleader. Mm -hmm. And I got to have a conversation with him and I'm like, he pretty much said a lot of the same thing that the way actually he calls it, he told me like, it's wicked the way we're, uh, it's so anti-biblical the way we're doing church right now. It's so yeah. anti what the Bible says. Yeah. So at the end of your book, you talk about how you're involved in new initiatives to help um, women in Iran who are victims of domestic violence and to sort of try to span between the different churches. And I thought it was fascinating. Um, so as we're, as we're just ending up, is there anything that listeners can do for you to help you in your ministry today? Uh, well, I do still serve in the underground church in Iran and Afghanistan. Um, I do not make money off of ministry. Everything that's raised goes straight to these people that are in need. A lot of them are women that have come out of domestic abuse. Those are, it's a lot of women by the well that have come out of marriages and horrible situations that Christ is using to reach, uh, the, uh, reach, uh, the, take the gospel to one of the darkest places in the world. And so I just ask fellow women and, uh, people to really support that. And also, um, uh, yeah, I, I continue, uh, I read a Bible, I, I read a verse, I think it's in Luke eight, I think it's verse two that said, uh, Jesus names women. And he says, they help Jesus by their own private means. Mm -hmm. And, and, um, I think I also have a heart to continue to help people coming out of abuse in this country. I've had single moms live with me. I've, um, been to court cases, just been at the ground fighting with them for them. And, uh, yeah, you can find me on social media or, uh, help the cause in the middle East right now. There's just a lot of things happening there. So, and the Christians continue to be slaughtered and killed for their faith. And again, a lot of these are women who've mm -hmm. come out of abuse. So, yeah. Well, we will put links to your social media and, um, and to where you can help support the causes uh, in the podcast notes. So please check for that. And again, Nagma's book is I Didn't Survive. Um, it's, it's honestly a really wonderful read. Um, you will see Jesus in the pages. Um, it'll challenge how you see the church in North America. And it's an important read. So please pick it up. I didn't survive. We'll put links to where you can purchase that as well. So Nagma, thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me, Sheila. I'm, I'm so honored to be on your podcast. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and if you could just stick around for just a few more minutes, I would love to ask you some extra questions for our Patreon. So if you join our Patreon listeners, then you can get some extra stuff from the podcast as well. Yeah. I'm so glad Nagma could join us for Domestic Violence Awareness Month. Um, this is an important month. And one of the things we've been talking about on the Facebook page this week is how churches can better support women who are escaping abusive marriages or going through divorce. Um, so I just a thought, as you are going to church this Sunday, look around. And, you know, we give baby showers. We give wedding showers to celebrate the wonderful moments in people's lives. And we're there for people when someone dies, but we're often not there for people when they leave an abusive marriage. And so ask yourself, are there people in my community that could really need my help? You know, is there something that I can do to bring a meal, to send a nice card, um, to give a gift card for groceries or gas or something, um, to help people through what is honestly even more traumatic than a death quite often? Um, so ask yourself that question as we end Domestic Violence Awareness Month. And again, do check out our merch um, and a portion of those sales will also go to help prevent domestic violence and rescue people who are victims of it. So thanks so much for joining us on the Bear Marriage Podcast, and we'll see you again next week. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs>